Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology Unit 15, Part 2 of Managing for Diversity with Agroecology. Um, first thing we're going to do is how do we evaluate our current practices in order to determine if we want to change and make it more sustainable and a better ecosystem, how do we go about that? Well, you got to know what you're doing first. So we have to look at what we're doing and when we use those organisms or substances and go from one environment to the other, what kind of issues are we going to have, uh, if any? And then if we have these interactions that we had talked about uh, in the last unit where how organisms interact, we, uh, if we understand that, what are those things within an ecosystem that might work in a nearby one or might not work in a nearby one. In other words, the effect could be different. And is it possible that one area can impact another area? Is it possible one area wouldn't? And then as a whole, everything that we do um, is called the landscape ecology. So in other words, our whole farm and adding them together is a whole landscape ecology. What ways can we use to evaluate different things we look at? Well, we can use uh, GIS, we can use satellite images, aerial photographs, um, and it's used very much today to see what is an area like and can we compare it to uh, the information from the past. Satellite images from the past, aerial photographs from the past. You can see the amount of green an area has, the amount of tree cover it has, um, the amount of just soil. So you can use all the different instruments that we have today in order to be able to tell what an area is like. Uh, an ecotone definition. Uh, ecotone is probably something you haven't heard of, but basically it's a transition area between two biomes. And a biome is an, is an area, it's just two different, er two different farms, let's say, that we're looking at. It could be larger than farms. And then when they come together, what things are there that are going to be that transition area that are going to affect one another. And that's what we talked about in the prior slide um, where there's the interaction between the two. It could be a narrow area. It could be a wide area. It could be local. It could be between, in this example, I list a field and a forest. Or it could be something regional where it's a transition between a whole forest and a, a prairie or a grassland area or ecosystem. So it depends what you're looking at, but an ecotone is just that area that's in between that might be affected by both of those two areas or biomes. Fancy, fancy names there. Here's an example of, and I'll leave this up here, um, but as you're looking at this, um, if you're looking at for figure one and two, it's just showing where it's equal and homogeneous surfaces in both cases. In other words, there are two things that work together. The A and the B and one are real, you know, easy, e e equal things. They don't interfere with each other. If you get down to number seven, you'll see where it's working real, real mixed in how it works uh, in terms of the interaction between the two. So. Take a little time to look at this. What's important to notice here is there's areas in which it can be modified totally, like in number eight, where it's an example of an ecotone that would be formed by one animal that modifies its envir environment, the herbivory one. Uh, and that's where the animal goes in there and eats it. And you can see and it left some plants in the one area that's green on the right hand side of that ecotone and then it went into the other area and ate all the plants away uh, or all the grasses let's say and, and it, how much it, that could affect an environment. So that's just the different examples and, and basically the big thing to understand here is there is interaction and sometimes there's overlap in areas and it's kind of mixed in that buffer zones or that ecotone. Um, on those borders and edges, um, are there benefits that, that you can have by having those interactions? Uh, it can be an extremely important part of that ecology um, because what it does is it provides an area that both of those species can exist uh, equally. Uh, it's generally an area where those insect populations will flourish. 
extremely well. They might not in one environment or the other, but they love to have the mixture of the two. Um, in other words, the forest and the grassland, somewhere in between. Uh, it's an area that where you can help protect the biological uh, with biological control agents. Um, and, and because you have that protected area that they like to flourish in, that you're able to take advantage of what they can do to control different insects, let's say, uh, or different diseases you might have. Um, it helps in some ways, it provides a, a cover area um, for something to survive. It might be during a drought, it might be during a, a flood or a huge rain, a monsoon season, depending on you know the area that you're in, the type of weather you're getting. It could be something in the winter time. Um, it provides an area for those, um, a, a place for those to be able to host, be hosted by that area and be able to survive because of it. Um, depending on the area that you're in, the border size can vary tremendously. And there's still a tremendous amount of research that needs to be done to fully exploit, okay, how do we, can we really control stuff in this? We see that it's happening, that the biota of the soil changes, that the amount of insects that are there based on certain conditions, they're not 100% sure and need to keep doing more research. Are we looking at enough variables to really know what's affecting this and trying to understand it so we can use it to our full advantage to make something totally sustainable for a long time to come? Um, we're seeing that there's a natural protection area, um, and when we have that between the two, between let's say the wooded area and the the grassy area, uh, it provides uh, protection, but it helps with wind flow. It slows it down in some cases. It can help the moisture and keep more moisture. It can moderate temperatures or help keep temperatures depending on the type of environment you're in. Um, the solar radiation, the amount that is shown, the trees will slow up that uh, radiation that gets down to the ground. You might have a crop or a, a type of uh, a flower or something that you have that likes less uh, sunlight. So you can uh, do that with the different areas. Um, so in that case, it's, it's great for that understory vegetation next to where those trees are. Um, possibly it could be something that would stop a fire. Um, if you had a border area that was full of rocks, it might be something that there's enough of a break from that and something that will burn it. It would keep it from going further. Uh, it might be so that the vegetation, the undergrowth, is so thick that it's not a strong enough of a fire to wipe out that area. And here's an example of a border and an edge. And here you have your field over here. And then you go into the edge of here, and, and it looks like there's some... Uh, weeds and then you have a, like a hedgerow and then there's a few trees in there. That's all the stuff that's going to help between buffer those two areas. Um, that buffer zone is a very important thing because one of the things they can do is they can trap the runoff. So if, if you put it in an area where the water might run in that direction, if it does try to uh, run off, it, it's not just soil that would run. It could be fertilizer or nutrients. It could be pesticides too. And it provides an area that would keep those there and keep them from going on to a different area. So that could be helpful uh, in terms of, and then if you tested the soil in those areas, you would know whether or not you have a lot of runoff and maybe you can control how much of stuff you're putting on, if anything. Um, how do you determine the size and shape of a buffer zone? And it's really, really an important decision, but Strips connecting habitats might be necessary to assist the movement of beneficial organisms between those buffer zones. So in other words, putting a buffer zone between two fields might not be enough. You might have to somehow use strips in between fields or through fields to help those beneficial organisms move around. And that's some of that experimenting that needs to be done and it's being done today, but it's something that needs to keep being worked on in order to help what is the best size and shape. Because if you have, you can have too much of a buffer zone, you can have too little of a buffer zone. Um, and then for buffer zones, um, we need to understand that it's not just the farm, the, the farm fields that we have, but it's the whole ecosystem. And we need to think of everything as one unit. So it's not just a corner of, uh, or a field of corn or a field of soybeans. 
and then a buffer zone here. It's all of those things together and how do they work together the best in the environment that we have that's gonna produce the most sustainable solution for us. Uh, here's another example. We saw that riparian zone, it's the same picture, but it is a buffer zone and they call it a riparian zone, but it's, it's an area that will help keep that runoff from happening, help keep the soil there, help keep the nutrients in that area and not going from another area and going into streams, uh, ponds, lakes, rivers, uh, and the oceans. Um, why do we need the buffer zones? Well, our natural resources are generally limited, so we need to value them as much as we can and need to really understand what it is that's happening with them so that we can use them to our best advantage. And then once we know how our farm contributes to that ecosystem as a whole, we can create a sustainable environment that is going to work for all of us and have a better environment, more food, and, it'll, and it will be around for the long run so that we can use it um, to our best advantage. Um, some of the diversity needs that we have in terms of becoming more sustainable, and we've talked a little bit about this in the past, it doesn't hurt to revisit it. Um, having multiple crops helps. The more diverse that ecosystem, the better off it is. Having fallow periods where we're resting the soil using cover crops um, really, really, really helps. Uh, crop rotation, putting different, don't use corn all the time, using the synthetic fertilizer to keep it going. You want to rotate it to different, like every three years, go to something different, and then if you can, have a fallow period. If you can do mulching, if it's practical, uh, and you're able to, you can do that. Make sure it's minimum tilling. The less you uh, mess with the soil, the better off it's going to be. We learned that li adding livestock to the picture and having pastures that you move around from fields, that could be that fallow year you have. Um, that that's a good thing and it adds beneficial organisms to um, beneficial insects uh, to the area. Uh, and that's all helpful to become more sustainable. Uh, and then you want to use agroforestry. To some extent, you could plant trees you could put in there and then take out after a few years. That's going to uh, bring in control of winds, um, things like that, control the runoff a little bit. But you also could make some money. If you, agroforestry means you're making money at, you're making agriculture and forestry go together. It certainly is a long run thing. It takes trees a while to grow, but they all grow differing one to, in differing time periods. So it would vary depending on what you want to do. Um, as time goes on, keep looking to see if there's perennial plants that you could use, whether it be just for uh, the corridors in between areas or whether it's for the crop you could use. If it's something possibly, it would be a good thing. And then using a successful land mosaic, and that's where we were talking about when we have these strips, these, these areas in between the buffer zones, um, that you make sure you do it and they're kind of figuring out that mosaic, which means it isn't, strip farming where it's 10 feet of of crops, two feet of the re rested area where you have insects in that you're trying to buffer zones you're trying to get to come in there. It's more like you create a mosaic and that's actually better than having it all neat and even, I guess is the best way to say it. Here's a picture way back from the beginning we saw where they were planting the wildflower seeds. Well, here's an example of diversity that's going to uh, attract pollinators next to what you have. It doesn't take a lot to do it. They'll be in there once the wildflowers come up, you'll have them, and that'll attract lots of beneficial um, organisms. And what we really, really, really want to make sure we do is looking at how we do diversity, we want to make sure we create a robust natural ecosystem. In other words, one that's complex enough that it will keep changing but doing the things we want to move in a positive direction. Um, some facts to wrap up what we're talking about. Um, 95% of our environment is urbanized. In other words, it's non-farming. Uh, managed for the use of agriculture, animal husbandry, and forestry. Half of our agriculture land is devoted to monocrops, which means the corner of the soybeans. And as we know, that creates that unnatural management. It, you have to use fertilizers uh, to keep it going, and we want to make it so more this sustainable. And then less than 5% of our land is protected 
uh, as parks or preserves. And, and that's an ecosystem, and that's an ecosystem that provides a lot of beneficial insects. So there's not much out there, so we want to make sure we don't lose everything we have. And that's why it's important to know there's only 5% that's uh, parks or forest preserves. Um, we're going to have to figure out ways in the future, so how do we cooperate better? How do we get farmers to cooperate, biologists, researchers, conservationists, sociologists, and how do we get that all to come together so that we can have successful research in the coming years? And today that really doesn't happen that much. There's a few projects trying to get some of this stuff to happen, but we have to have more of it happening if it's going to be successful in the future. Um, here's just an example of a conservationist coming out in an area, and here's just this tractor tire here, just a, a place where um, you don't really see it real all, but just about below the knee of the conservationist um, is a wire that separates it to pasture land, and it's just where they can come get water, the animals can come get water on either side of that wire, so that's all it is, is a watering thing there, really wasn't meant to be something special. Uh, what's some of the things for the future that researchers need to look at? Well, one of them is, is how do you design and manage a system to provide habitats that's going to attract other species and work well with the crops that we want to grow? How do relationships between ecosystems and agroecosystems interrelate? Um, we kind of understand ecosystems, but we haven't really done enough experimentation in agrosystems uh, in, in order to see how we can get them to more emulate what the ecosystems are like and become closer to them and work with them. And then um, we need to work on conservation projects that will allow uh, large-scale implementation of areas and regions. And um, I just read an article over the weekend that was kind of interesting, and it's um, an, an agriculture publication. It's just a newspaper that's put out in um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, in Iowa and a little bit of Illinois and basically it was talking about how out in western Illinois and part of Wisconsin, part of Minnesota and part of Iowa it's um, sort of hilly so how you farm there is different. Erosion control is a big thing. Basically what was happening is there was this one farmer who um, was losing a lot of his topsoil and he got a hold of the local conservationist and he actually got some money from the county in order to put in dams and uh, riparian ways and grassways in, in which he started trying to control the way in which rainwater would move off of his land. He started changing the way he cropped and instead of having um, terraced farming where he pretty much farmed everything and just had a few grass waterways, he changed it and where he had more grassways um, and he actually has more of a production uh, increase than when he didn't have it. He right now has um, 12 areas on his property. I think he had 360 acres that he owned. Um, and he was close to the Wisconsin River. He was um, within a mile and a half of the Wisconsin River. So there was a lot of bluff areas and stuff he had. So that it wasn't all farmland that he has. But basically what he's worked into, he started getting his neighbors to get interested in it. And there's now 10 farmers in his area that are doing it. And, and, they're, and they saw with him and then another farmer that it kind of started about the same time as he did because they were both losing a lot of productive farmland um, to soil erosion. They've actually kept it where they aren't getting any soil erosion at all. And everyone upstream from what they are going away from the um, uh, Mississippi River, um, they're all finding that they're all uh, producing more and more stuff and it took a little bit. They paid for part of it themselves, but they had share with the county too. But they're actually creating an environment where they're starting to now um, re-implement wetlands that weren't wetlands because they kept washing out all the time. Um, so there's actually a lot of great things that have been going on and very close to, uh, to our home. Um, some more future research topic is um, looking and understanding our ecology and using our natural resources and how we can put those together because we haven't done a really good job of that. Um, we've been taking a lot of oil, so we've got to see ways in which we can use maybe some of the other natural resources. Uh, let's say some of the biofuels would be maybe a good possibility using the turbines. 
Um, development of methods for farmers to create sustainable and long-term food production systems. Well, because the food production chain pretty much is the farmer raises the stuff, it goes to some company and they do their magic and come up with all these different package things we have or possibly produce we have in stores, that kind of stuff, that we actually have to find ways like co-ops and farmers markets. Are there better ways that we can do that and use some of that system and, and have it closer to home, of course? Um, and then how can we all get together and do this research? We all should be looking for the solution to the same problem. Um, that always doesn't happen. But we can't make it happen if we don't change how we currently farm. And that's a big thing, but we have to make sure that we aren't asking the farmers to burden and make less money while we do it. We just have to convince them that doing it's going to keep their money the same or actually increase what they make. And then for our conclusion, we need to diversify using biocontrols as opposed to synthetic controls. We need to get an integrated pest management system to replace the pesticides, fertilizers, and herbicides. And in terms of that integrated pest management, it's a big word that I haven't used enough of, but basically what it is, IPM is the short of how we call it, in horticulture, but basically it's developing a whole system to look at everything and what affects everything. It used to be, oh, you throw Roundup at it, oh, you throw an herbicide at it, oh, you do this, oh, you do that, and we really didn't look like, how do you get the whole piece to work together? And that's what we've got to work on in terms of, uh, you know, getting better. And here is a list of our attributions.